back with story time. This is the second book, The Exodus of Darkness from the Letter of the Infinite series. You can see it says book two. I'm gonna start with a quick poem. The Kabbalah of She. I've aligned with the lines of the universe, drew circles around perception, pushed past the constant blast of concealment. The godly soul found within. I found her out of sin. A sun that shined clarity on the abstract. One turned back. And I was and will be godly as she. All right, we're going to jump in. This week, we're in the Torah portion of Va'era. And in the book, The Exodus of Darkness, it's called Fall on High. So this is one of the names, the Tetragrammaton, the Shem Havaya of God's names. Hopefully it's not backwards on your screen. And it's the Yud, and we say K, Vav K, because we don't pronounce it. That's the level of this name. And just before we jump into the book, just understanding this, the gematria, the numerical value is 26. This is the name when we say the Shema Yisrael, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. We're saying two different names of Hashem, of God, of, and understanding God in different ways, how we interface, how we see God interacting with us. So this is the name, the Shem Havaya, the Tetragrammaton. Basically, the God is the all-merciful, the way that we understand God in this way that is it's all good. It's tapped into the next world also, but that we could bring into this world. So this is, just keep this in mind. This is 26. This is like the highest level. This is where we're trying to go when we talk about the redemption or the redemptive state. It's coming into the state of understanding that we can't zoom out far enough, but that if we were able to, then we would know it's all good. So that's sort of like something you can meditate on as we jump into this. So this chapter... It opens up, so the verse in the Torah portion, Hashem, God is saying, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but by my name, this Tetragrammaton, the Shem Havaya, I did not make myself known to them. So he's cluing us into the amount of revelation that was brought in and that basically that these patriarchs, these holy patriarchs saw an element, a, a, a big element of Hashem, but not the ultimate this is what he's alluding to here in this chapter and in this verse in the Torah portion for this week that this ultimate revelation has not been shown to them. So we learn from this verse that there are levels to revelation, that God tells Moshe, now we're in the, the section of the Torah portion where Moses is found and then already jumping into Moses doing the miracles and, and, and that's kind of where we're at in the story. So he's telling Moses, Moshe, that he did not reveal the full vision of the redemption to the patriarchs, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Rashi, who's the foremost commentator on the Torah, explains that even without seeing this full vision, the Avot, the patriarchs, did not question the Holy One's compassion and devoted themselves entirely to godliness. Because as we spoke about, the Yud Vavke, this Tetragrammaton, so this is the ultimate compassion, the ultimate mercy, the ultimate goodness. So they're saying even though that wasn't revealed to them in this very revealed state, they were still tapped into that and they still had the full emunah, the full trust that this is the manifestation of the creator, of the divine. And Rabbi Natan of Breslov that is on my jacket, this is Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov and Rabbi Natan. So he explains that Hashem, God is telling us to be like the Avot, these patriarchs, not to despair when life's challenges emerge remembering that we cannot see the full, infinite picture. We are in exile, physically and spiritually, living in a time when the ephemeral light of creation is hidden. But we are always capable of tying our awareness to our spiritual promised land. So that's when we're talking about the redemptive state, that's what we're saying to our promised land, Israel, and leaving Egypt, that's actually the section that we're in in the Torah, we're talking about leaving the constricted part, that which opposes us being in full alignment or in full trust and faith with ourselves as creations, but to our creator, to our source. And the promised land in Israel, always reaching this promised land, that's finding and reaching toward this redemptive state. So our awareness toward our spiritual promised land. It's our emunah, our faith in divine compassion embodied in this name, the Yudke Vavke, we keep talking about, that can allow us to see the good and to do good with what we are given. We read, in, we read in the last chapter, last week, that Moshe was hesitant to be a leader. So he, he thought, 
I'm not suited for this. He was so humble, but he also thought that he had a stutter. Maybe he did have a stutter. Maybe it was that his words, when we're talking about that God is saying that he didn't reveal himself to the patriarchs, maybe Moses was on such a high level of truth and goodness, but on a level that God didn't reveal himself. And also Moses, some of the things that he was talking about, we weren't even ready for. So we heard them as a stutter because we didn't have the we we couldn't we didn't have the vessel to contain the amount of truth and light that Moses was saying. So we heard it as this cut up language, or we weren't able to hear it in its completion and its in its wholeness. So we heard it as a stutter. But I think that Rizal says it, so it wasn't actual actually a stutter. It's that he was so tapped in to this space that we're talking about the that's connected to the Shem Havaya. It's basically above the dichotomy of the reality that we're in now, where there's these opposing forces and these equal potentials, he's in the space above that. So it's the space of all good, as we talk about the messianic era, the time, the revelation, the redemption. This is, we say, kulo tov, it means all good, or kulo shabbat, a place that we're not toiling for our bread, so to speak, in, in the sin of Adam. So it's a space above that and beyond that. It's a space where it's all goodness and it's all redemption. So if Moses was tapped into this space and he's speaking from this space, but we don't have the vessel, we're not able to contain that, so we heard it as a stutter. So he thought, and he was hesitant to be a leader. He didn't think that he was ready for that. He doubted that he was the most fitting. He had a speech impediment, as he spoke about. And even on a practical level, he thought that he was the least likely to speak for a nation and plead for the redemption. But Hashem, God reminds us, and reminds him that as God of the Avot, of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of the future redemption, anything is possible, and the only thing to stop a person from achieving what is meant for themselves is actually themselves. It's like Jay-Z says, like he's looking in the mirror, his own only opponent, you know? Ultimately, Moshe and Moses merited that the entire Torah would manifest through him, because we call it Torah Moshe. So when we're talking about the Torah, and we're talking about all the major religions that are based on this and that are remixes to whatever capacity of the Torah, which you know some refer to as the Old Testament. Of course, Jews refer to it as the eternal word of God. So there's no old or new. This is eternal forever. So this is called in, the Jews call it in, in Hebrew, it's Torah Moshe. It's the five books of Moshe, of Moses. So this all came through him, which is the highest level of physicality, one in which the highest level of spirituality can emanate. Moses' journey of hesitation and self-doubt is one that we all struggle with, but the lesson is that in the end, he reached the ultimate level of revelation. We see that as we read the Pasuk, the verse, I appeared to Avram, yet I was not known to them by my name. So as we started this chapter off with, which starts with the original verse, that this name, the Shem Havaya, that God was saying that he didn't reveal to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as this sort of consciousness, this redemption, this redemptive state, this all goodness, he didn't reveal that, only the El Shaddai he, he revealed to them. So here we're learning that Moses reached an even higher level than all the great Sadiqim prophets and our patriarchs that preceded him. As it's written, no other prophet like Moshe had arisen in Israel who knew Hashem face to face because there's this achronaim, this idea of seeing from the back. Of course, these are all just ways for us to relate, but there's like seeing something from the back or getting something from the back. And then there's the face, which is representative of the full revelation. So it's there's the levels of these prophetic levels of revelation and alignment. So the Kuzari explains that one of the reasons why Moshe and his generation merited greater revelation than the previous generations wasn't because of their own greatness, but rather because they, as a people, had become a multitude, suffering from suffix, from doubt. So it was something that was needed even more so. The revelation is needed more when the concealment, or at least our perception of concealment, is greater. Hashem had to reveal himself in greater ways to convince them of the truth. Hence, Israel heard the voice of Hashem when he spoke with Moshe, as it's written, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that people hear when I speak to you. The only greater revelation than Moshe's receiving of the Torah will be the final redemption, when everything will be Torah. In other words, the total oneness and underlying this, the seeming multiplicity of the universe will be revealed. So we're going to understand the oneness and us thinking, having these 
doubts, hesitations, fear, anxiety, all the things that are taking us out of alignment that are putting us into this constricted or this dark or doubting state, they will dissipate. And I was talking about yesterday, I think the light that dispels the darkness. We use the word dispel because as Melech Shlomo, as King Solomon says that the same of light over darkness is wisdom over foolishness. Because when you bring in wisdom or truth, which we're talking about in the Tanya, the Altar Rebbe this week, if you're doing daily Tanya, it's that when that reveals, because it's tapped into, because it's truth and light, and it's tapped into that element and that oneness. So the rest of the things that oppose it disappear because they're just an imagination. They're just the Koach HaMedame, the power of the imagination. So when everything will be Torah and this oneness will be revealed, this will be the time referred to as Kulo Shabbat, as we spoke about, when it will always be Shabbat. And I love Rav Shlomo's insight into this verse where we see how to bring godly awareness into our everyday lives. He reminds us that God appeared to each of the Avot as individuals, to Avram alone, then to Yitzchak, and then to Yaakov, which is Jacob, revealing himself to each of them in the way that was best suited for their growth into their truest and most expansive selves. In this way, we learn that every action, especially those we take toward each individual we encounter, is an opportunity for holy revelation and redemption. The Baal Shem Tov used to shiver when he would meet a new person. And the Baal Shem Tov, if you don't know, he's, he's the Hasidic master that had brought out all of Hasidim, or Hasidus, out of his work and out of what he revealed in the world. So when you think about Chabad, Lubavitch, that's all around the world as emissaries and they have houses and you can, the Chabad house in the country that you'd never think, they're there, you know what I mean? And you can go there for a nice Shabbat meal uh, they'll, they'll just take you in. They're so full of love and light, inspired by the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So the Lubavitcher Rebbe is the seventh and the last of the Chabad dynasty of Hasidim. And the Baal Shem Tov was basically the altar of the first, but the Baal Shem Tov preceded that. So it all comes out of the Baal Shem Tov. So he used to shiver when he would meet a new person. And when asked why, he replied, the Torah tells us, love your neighbor like you love yourself. The hafta le'echa kamocha. People think le'echa means your neighbor, but it literally means the one you are talking Okay, you can leave a comment if, if I'm back. I think I'm back. So in order to reveal godliness in the world, we need to help uncover the pieces of holiness that are in each and every one of us. That's what he's saying. So you would shiver if you understood that it was tapped into the infinite when you're meeting somebody who seemingly seems finite and physical, a person, but within them is this infinite spark, this godly spark. So each time you're meeting somebody, you're getting closer to understanding or to seeing God and to feeling God because each of us is a piece of that. There's a famous story of the Talmudic sage Hillel from the first century BCE who moved to Israel to study Torah in Jerusalem with the great sages of the time, eventually becoming the Nasi, the president of the Sanhedrin High Court. Much like Moshe, Hillel was very humble and like Moshe, he looked up to Aaron, the high priest, Moses' brother, in the way that he conducted himself to love peace and pursue peace, love all God's creatures and creations and bring them close to Torah. The often repeated story of Hillel was originally recorded in Talmud Shabbat, you've probably heard this. A Gentile had decided that he wanted to convert to Judaism, but would only do so if a rabbi would taught him, would teach him the entire Torah while he stood on one foot. This person had gone to other sages, but to no avail. Without giving up, he made his way to Hillel and asked him the same. He said, Hillel, with his great compassion and patience, replied, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the whole of Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and study it. In this time of anxiety, self-doubt, self-hate, depression, it seems that love your neighbor as you love yourself may not be as strong as a statement as what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. This teaches us not to do harm or treat other people around us in a negative way. Because even when we know we aren't being the best with ourselves, this verse reminds us that it is certainly best not to do it to anyone else. Even if at times we are hateful or overly critical with ourselves, 
if the commandment is to love others as we love ourselves and we feel that we don't have enough love for ourselves, then the only way to keep this mitzvah, this commandment, is to increase the love we have for ourselves and decrease the self-doubt and self-hate. Because if we don't show ourselves the proper love, how can we properly love others? So we almost need both of these, these psukim, both of these verses, because if we're in a state disconnected from ourselves and we're supposed to show how we're loving ourselves to somebody else, but we're not really loving ourselves. So then the other verse comes to teach us that we need to love the neighbor. And if we're bringing that love, then we can bring it back to ourselves as well. Um, we just got a comment. The pursuit of peace is testifying that we're in a state of battle with ourselves. Um, I put my phone a little far from myself this time. So it's like, but I'm, I'm still able to read it. I love when you guys comment. I love when you guys jump in and send love. So thanks so much for tuning in. The Lubavitch Rebbe teaches us that Moshe, Moses, embodies the attribute of Chochmah, of knowledge. And that is why the Torah was revealed through him, this Torah Moshe that we're talking about, the five books of Moses. The Avod, on the other hand, were the embodiment of Midot, of emotions. As we covered last chapter, and last week when we did this story time, Avram served Hashem, God, through love. Yitzchak served through awe and judgment, as it's written, awe of Isaac. As a result, Yitzchak, Isaac, couldn't tolerate evil in the world. And Yaakov represents mercy and reached his, or Jacob we're talking about, is kind of the, he comes to Mitak and he comes to bring in the forefathers before him. He's the harmony, he's the tiferet and, and mercy. And he reached this level of righteousness by virtue of his complete connection to the Torah. His intelligent emotionality perfected both the love on the Abraham side and the awe on the Isaac side, embracing both modes of service. Moshe and Moses had elements of all these, but it was his primary attribute of chokhmah, of wisdom, that merited his being the prophet to present the Torah in its revealed state. As it's written, remember the Torah of Moses, my servant. The Rebbe explains, and we're talking about the seventh Chabad Hasidic Rebbe in that lineage, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, explains that during the revelation, divisions dissolved and knowledge and emotion were united. In the Pasuk verse that opens our parasha, Moshe was to understand that even if his primary attribute is knowledge, he must join it with emotion and thereby strengthen his faith to the point that there would be no questions or doubts. The reason the name Yaakov, Jacob, is used when naming the Avot, these forefathers, and not the name Yisrael, which he later is called when he's, after he struggles with the angel and reaches this redemptive state, because revelation is revealed not by avoiding our fears, but by facing them. And so the revelation and the connection that he had through the prophecy that he was receiving initially was through the dream state, which is the lower revelation. But, in, but eventually, once he started to face his enemy, so to speak, his brother Asa, where he used to run out the other side when he'd come home, he eventually faced him, and you know the whole story, that was when he reached this higher level and eventually was called Israel, which is the redemptive state. So the reason that we use the word, the name Yaakov instead of Yisrael is that Yaakov, Jacob, is linguistically related to the word Ekev, meaning heal, which represents a lower level of revelation. So this whole thing, we're talking about the levels of the revelation. The first verse that we brought in, saw so about the patriarchs and the, the level of revelation that they were on. And then here is the same thing represented by Yaakov. And he, because he's defended, because he's beauty, because he's mercy, and because he had these different levels of revelation, they're also seen in the manifestation, the embodiment of his name. Whereas Israel represents the higher redemptive manifestation, when the letters are rearranged, they make the phrase, li rosh, the mind is mine. The lesson is that knowledge must join with emotion to reach full faith. This is what joins the higher knowledge to the lower, the heel. So Ekev, Yaakov, the heel, to the Yisrael and the li rosh, to the knowledge. When emotions encompass knowledge, they strengthen faith and muna and lead to action. As we learn in the Tanya, love brings a person to do good while fear leads a person to turn away from evil. Whereas knowledge by itself does not lead to action, in fact, it can lead to detachment. And evil, even while learning what to do, one can lose the impetus to do it. This is why the Torah reveals the 613 mitzvot of what to do and what not to do as pertaining to our divine service. So it's not just enough to learn and try to stay inspired and feel connected 
in the knowledge and in the wisdom, but these mitzvot, the reason why they're so important is because this is how we actualize love. Meaning if you continue, you know, you'll meet girls that are like, or guys, but you know, I'm using this example because I've heard this where it's like, yeah, his actions didn't match his words, you know? So it's this, you can try to tell somebody that you love them as many times as you want in a relationship. But if it's, if this love is not manifested with action, then how real is it? Because it's the action that actualizes the love. And the root of the Hebrew word ava, love, is the root is in Aramaic, hav means to give. So it's like this relation between giving and actual real love. It's, it's something that's created and it's something that is sustained through action. So this is, this is the key of the mitzvot. It's not just, okay, intellectually study this thing, meditate on it and feel great, and hopefully that sustains itself. It's that the actions are what will bring this to an actual thing that is sustainable and real and into alignment and into this embodiment because you're actually busy, you're a suk bedaval, you're, you're busy in these actions, actualizing this love and this tavah. Learning alone is not Torah, learning, it must be paired with action. As we, as we said, this is why our main prophets preceding Moshe were called avot, fathers, because they acted toward all as parents act toward their child, both with action and compassion. The verse names each of the avot, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Hashem's relationship to them as El Shaddai, as we spoke about. This name in itself connotes a material divine relationship, as the word Shaddai means breast. There is a sense of being so close to the infinite one that these high souls were like babies nursing from their mother. But this is still an anthropomorphized, godly relationship. However, with Moshe, with Moses, who perfects the blend of knowledge and emotion and action that we're speaking about, God reveals the ineffable name, the light of the infinite it represents, this Shem Havaya, the Tetragrammaton, the Yud Kei Vav Kei, as we're speaking about, which will bring the visual again, if you can see it. We see, sometimes people tell me I speak like way too quickly, so I'll try to slow it down. Also, if anybody is in LA and wants and is looking for a place, I mean, I might fill up quick, but I'm hosting a Shabbat dinner, making Marak Temani, Yamanite soup, so you can definitely shoot me a DM. But there's also so many other epic things happening in Pico Robertson, so if you're looking for a place or anything like that, I'm happy to help set people up. If you happen to be in town and are looking for something super elevated, um, epic community and all that goodness. Yes, slow is the note, delicious. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try to slow down. There's just a lot to get through, but the thing is, you could also pick this up on Amazon, this book. This is the second one. We're in the second chapter now of the book correlated with where we're at in the Torah. So we're in Shemot, we're in Exodus. And so this is light of the infinite. And this is the Exodus of light or the Exodus of Darkness, the one before was the Genesis of Light. Sorry, I'm like trying to read these comments at the same time, so it's a little hard. Um, what up, Hannah? Happy birthday. Um, Ariella, I'll, I'll try to do it slower. Um, if anybody has any questions, let me know. This is also gonna be, I'm gonna post it as a hard post on my Instagram, and then it'll also be, if you go into YouTube um, and type in Light of Infinite or Air Safar, then you'll find some of the past ones. And just, I have like these two minute versions as well. They usually go up uh, before Shabbat. So where do we leave off? Um, perfection. So basically, yeah, so we're talking about the revelation of God's names, right? Hey, from New Zealand, what's up? <laughs> hey, from LA. Uh, so we have a piece by Mark Chagall. I have a lithograph in the other room. This is just a print. Mark Chagall right here. He's my favorite artist. And then this is the Sfirot. It's a poster I made. You could get it on lightoftheinfinite.com. Um, just go to the shop there. And then I also have this, the book and these jackets and everything. But anyway, just some background on the art that's behind me. So we see this perfection of Moshe. So right now we're talking about Moses, right? Because that's where we're at in the Torah and all of the things that we can learn from Moshe as this archetypal state of consciousness as uh, Deepak Chopra um, sort of articulated it when we were talking about this book, actually. Um, so we see this perfection in Moses 
and his relationship with God play out to the point of full redemption of the nation. In Talmud Yevamot, so we're talking about the Gemara here. Um, hey, Australia. Um, so Talmud and Gemara, so it expounds on the verse in Devarim, in the book of Devarim, we're talking about Torah Moshe, that says there was no other prophet like Moshe before or after and discussed how Moshe and Moses' prophecies differed from all others. The sages say it was as if Moshe saw through a clear lens while other prophets' visions was not completely clear. Only Moshe witnessed the God of the ineffable name, this Yud Kei Vav Kei that we're talking about, in an unconcealed form, fully supernatural, preceding creation. For the Avot, talk amongst yourselves in the comments section. I'll, I'll be back. All right, I'm back. Just gonna plug this in just in case, hold on. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with me. All right, hopefully that's good. Um, okay, we're back. So, yeah, so this revelation and their prophetic visions came to them through dreams. So we were talking about earlier that Yaakov's state of revelation initially was through the dream straight state like Avimelech, like Bilam, like this lower level of prophecy of receiving God, of, of aligning and being one in communication in a sense, or at least getting messages from God. But once he moved from Yaakov, from Ekev to Israel, and he started to face his fears, as we spoke about, facing your fears is the way to bring this redemptive state, then he had a higher revelation. So Moshe, now we're jumping to Moses, that is why in reference to the prophecies, it says, I appeared, Vayala. And with Moshe, it says, I was known, nodati. So Moshe's encounters with Hashem, with God, were face to face. One, so when we're talking about, da, we're talking about da'at, so that's, that's, that's fully connected, it's fully understanding. It's the combination of chokhmah and bina, of wisdom and understanding, it's, it's knowledge. So this is saying that Moses is interfacing with God, his revelation of God was connected to this root word of da'at which I could show you um, the Sefirot, they're behind me, but we'll show you right here as well. So da, so there's Chokhmah and Bina, and then there's dots in the middle. So all the middle ones are sort of this idea of Shalom, of reaching that level of peace, of understanding, of alignment, that's always by bringing two opposite sides. So. Even even the word repair, it's repair. So it's it's bringing back, it's pairing these things that oppose each other and bringing them into alignment. So that's the that's the middle path, and that's represented by Yaakov, and then further by Moshe that we're talking about. So Moses's encounters with the divine, with God, were face to face in a sense that we're trying to understand before we were talking about something from behind. If you are hesitant or don't wanna be in full connection with somebody and you have to give them something, and it's your enemy, let's say, so you're kind of giving it reluctantly behind the back, whatever, you're not, you know, you're not like fully connecting. But when it's somebody who you love and you wanna give it with your full heart, so that's in this sense, it's the face-to-face -face element. You're trying to, you're looking at them, you're loving them, you're giving it, you're fully connected to that moment, you wanna cherish that moment. So this revelation, as we keep bringing it back to the first verse, is that the patriarchs didn't have this revelation, this Shem Havaya, this Tetragrammaton. They weren't known, they didn't know God in this, as God exists above nature. So more connected to Keter for sure, or Chochmah, but they were more connected to Bina, to this understanding and this space connected to this universe. So Moses was connected on all levels and the space above these levels, the space before the creation of this world in where, mo where everything is good and there's no nature and there's no dichotomy and there's no, these, you know, just to allow free will to exist. There's these polar opposites that, you know, they have, as Melech Shlomo says, Zelumadze, everything has its opposite and opposing force. 
So Moses was tapped into the space above that, which is the next world, but it's also the preceding world, the Torah Atikastima, this Torah that precedes the Torah that is given for us, which starts with Breshi, which starts with Beth, this number two. So Moshe was eventually able to bring into being at will, whereas the previous prophecies, which we're talking about being able to interface with God, whereas the previous prophets were not. So it's also explained the ineffable name, this this tetragrammaton, Hashem HaVeah, pronounced as Adonai because Hashem Adon, master, Adon is master of all the worlds and beings, and his will cannot be denied. He can alter nature and events, canceling normal conduct and adjusting the behavior and essence of his living creatures however he wishes. This is the aspect of Hashem that became revealed in the book of Shemot and the story of Exodus. So now we're in this book, and I just see a comment now from... Uh, Pinny, what up? <laughs> um, I just played in Birmingham in the UK with Pinny um, on this conference, Limud. It was amazing. And we're talking about collaborating now and doing some other international Limud. So much love. And Moishi House, Pico Robertson, what's up, guys? Um, I think some of you guys are coming for dinner tomorrow or Shabbat. Um, so I'll see you soon. So in this Torah portion that we're talking about, God reminds Moses that he can lead the nation, that he can stand up to Pharaoh, and that he can do anything that he imagines. He can manifest as there is nothing Hashem cannot do. Because he's, once you're on that level, you're completely tapped into Hashem. And when, you're, when you realize that you actually are capable of anything because you're a piece of God, and when you're connected to that piece, then instead of being connected to the finite or the limited part of yourself, you're actually connected to the infinite and the limitless part of yourself. So he's saying that there's nothing that God can't do. And any godly messenger can will fate into physicality. So imagine a world in which you had no self-doubt. You only saw the good. You only spoke positively. Your faith was full and anxiety had no place. It seems we are further from that space than ever. But if Moshe, with a speech impediment, could become the speaker for the enslaved, freeing them from Pharaoh, we can become our own advocates to and for ourselves. The core teaching of Rab Nachman of Breslov is this Azamra, teaching ourselves to rectify harsh judgment and finding the good point, which is correlated to the godliness, the godly spark within ourselves and others judging it favorably, bringing merit to ourselves and others. Music is born of, act, of the act of sifting the good or the bad notes to get to the good notes, as beautiful melodies are the various combinations of the good notes. So the bad notes, as we call them, are the dissonant parts. So when somebody's doing a solo and they hit a bad note, it feels out of alignment and a bit weird. So the idea, if, if you want it to be in alignment and in melody and in key, so then you're skipping those notes that are dissonant and are not in key. So this is the same thing that we need to do within ourselves and for others, and it's by judging favorably and skipping those bad, harsh judgments and trying to always see the good within everything. This is the practice we have to continually perfect in our lives in order and taking away the bad from ourselves and others. Well, when that becomes second nature, we can reach a level where we don't see bad, bringing ourselves to a place of kulotov, of all good, as we spoke about, a place where all the melodies of life lift us up. So God is telling Moshe that whatever impingement he feels he has, it cannot impede him from his destiny, nor the people from the redemption. So once Mo Moshe and Moses was able to rid himself of his doubt and submit to his destiny, he was able to perform miracles. And of course, miracles happen every moment disguised as nature, but if we cloud them with doubt or anxiety, we can't see the miraculous good. So as we spoke about, the redemption is revealed by facing our fear, fears and not by avoiding them. So with Pharaoh, we see that each plague, and after each of them, he agrees that Hashem is the Almighty, but then he forgets, doubts, becomes faithless, and fooled again, thinking he is in control and can save himself. And then Moshe brings the next plague. He begs for it to stop and be reversed, saying that he will allow Moshe to take B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, out and serve their God. But the plague abates, and with it, Pharaoh's compassion, and he hardened his heart again, and this just keeps happening. And it's kind of like the same with us to whatever extent, you know, like you're in a great space, everything's in alignment, you, you've pushed away all your anxiety, doubts, fears, and all that, and you're able to bring in more and more goodness and you're feeling better and better in alignment. And, 
And then all of a sudden something happens that throws you off course and then you have to go through this process again. I once co-produced a short film for the Accidental Talmudist series called Schnooks. The short was titled The Parking Spot. And one of my favorite actors, Stephen Tublowski, was the star. You may know him as Ned from Groundhog Day or as Jack Barker, Action Jack from Silicon Valley. The scene opens with this character who is in a rush to a big money meeting but was unable to find a parking spot. We hear him on the phone pleading with his colleague to try to stall the meeting. Eventually he prays, oh please God, help me get this parking spot. If you help me get the parking spot, I'll give you 10% of this deal to charity. I'll give 10% of every deal. I'll call my mother and then <laughs> right then, a car pulls out and he gets all excited and he says, wow, never mind, God, I got it. When everything is running smoothly, when everything seems aligned, we sometimes think foolishly that it is because of our own doing and not that of Hashem. It's often in those times when we get shaken up and fall from on high so that we can be humbled again. We enter into a space of questioning and then can remember the fundamental answer that everything is from the hands of the divine and that all we do and have is meant to be connected back to the source, to spiritualize reality, not to materialize it. With that said, may we rid ourselves of doubt, release the chains of our own struggles and the parts of our minds that enslave us and manifest the promised land within ourselves. Shabbat Shalom. Love you guys.